From using cutting-edge AI technology to create more food for less money, to combining ancient methods with advanced tech to grow better crops, here's everything you need to know about how scientists are developing new crop genetics for food and profit. First things first, we should talk about how machine learning is taking the field to another level. I know what you're thinking. Isn't machine learning that AI thing everyone keeps talking about? Well, you're not wrong. And in case you're wondering how it's used in crop genetics, we should probably take a look at the guy behind these recent advancements, aka James Schnabel. You see, James is a crop geneticist working out of the University of Nebraska, and he works with a team of researchers with one goal in mind, getting a higher yield out of crops. Schnabel and his research team don't spend all their time in the lab. Instead, they go out into the fields and grow corn and sorghum every year. However, they're not exactly farmers, because they use advanced satellite imaging to monitor each field. This helps them get the crown jewel of the scientific community, some sweet, sweet data. A crop's growth rate relies on a bunch of factors, like the surrounding environment, the fertilizer being used, and how experienced the farmer is. But the biggest factor of all is the crop's genetic makeup. Certain crops just grow way faster and stronger, and researchers like Schnabel are trying to understand why. Now, once they've collected all the data points, they need to use it to predict which genetic strains perform best. And that's where machine learning comes into play. You see, there's just way too much data to go through manually. So, Schnabel and his team just train data models to make the predictions for them. Now, in case you're wondering what sort of data they're collecting, it all has to do with genomics and phenomics. Those are some fancy words, but they're not all that complicated. Genomics is the study of all the genes in an organism and what they do. As these genes interact with each other and get exposed to outside influences, they turn into something called a phenotype. So, if you have a gene that could make you six feet tall, but you don't get a good enough diet and can only reach five foot nine, your height, which is a combination of all those different factors, is your phenotype. Phenomics basically studies how genes work with each other and how the environment outside affects their expressions. You can see how useful this would be for crops, because if a crop has a gene that makes it more nutritious, but it needs a certain kind of fertilizer to properly use the gene, combining genomics and phenomics can help scientists figure out how to activate it. Stuff like this is revolutionary for farmers, because it can help them save money and grow better crops. Just think about it. If a farmer knows what fields need more fertilizer, they can use it more strategically and get a better harvest at the end of the growing season. Schnabel and other researchers like him are also pinpointing crops that perform better than others, and they're crossbreeding them to create what I like to call super crops. Let me tell you, farmers are going to be over the moon when they find out what's in store. After all, these super crops give a better yield each harvest, and they also require fewer nutrients to grow. That's a win-win as far as farmers are concerned, and we consumers get to enjoy the fruits of their labors as well. It's also easy to forget just how hard the life of a farmer used to be. Plagues could wipe out entire harvests. But nowadays, farmers have disease-resistant crops that they don't have to worry about as much. But wait, aren't these basically just genetically modified organisms, also known as GMO crops? And aren't GMOs, like, really bad for you? Well, my friends, I'd say it's time for some good old-fashioned myth-busting. Genetically modified crops are not bad for you. Don't just take it from me. The National Academy for Science confirmed that there's nothing wrong with eating GMO crops. And the Food and Drug Administration vets pretty much all the food that you can buy in stores. So, if they clear GMO crops for your consumption, it's safe to say they're not harmful. If you think about it, GMOs have been around for decades by this point. But have you heard of anyone falling sick after eating them? Probably not. Although I can definitely see why they might make people skittish. I mean, scientists meddling with the natural world? Since when has that ever gone right? But look, we're not talking about Jurassic Park over here. No one's out there trying to bring back a hundred million year old vegetable that'll take over the world. Scientists are just figuring out how to make farming as efficient as possible. Their job revolves around studying crop genes and figuring out which ones prevent diseases so that only those crops are grown. In a way, crop genetics might be one of the oldest fields in history. When I say old, I mean thousands of years old. This isn't an exaggeration. Humans have been modifying crop genes for the last 10,000 years. Cause if you've ever seen wild corn or wheat, 
you'll notice that it looks a little frail. That's because the crops that farmers harvest nowadays are basically a mutant supercharged version of their wild origins. And the first farmers from way back used something called selective breeding to kickstart that process. Simply put, thousands and thousands of years ago, a bunch of ancient humans noticed that some shafts of wheat were a bit thicker and stronger than others. So they took the seeds from those plants and started using them to grow their own crops. Wheat is just an example here, mind you. Ancient humans did this with basically any crop they were trying to grow. Eventually, the stronger crops gave birth to even better crops as the cycle continued. Because humans are smart. And even all those years ago, we knew that picking out the best crops and only using their seeds was a good idea. Now, they didn't have fancy terms like genomics and phenomics and whatnot, but this is crop genetics in its purest form. In a way, Schnabel and his colleagues are part of an ancient tradition, and there's a reason we've kept trying to advance crop genetics across the centuries. There are tons of benefits to using crop genetics. As recently as 2022, researchers have managed to crack the code behind photosynthesis. That's basically when a plant absorbs sunlight and turns it into food. And scientists decided to supercharge photosynthesis for an experimental batch of soybeans. Basically, they figured out a way to make natural photosynthesis way more efficient. How? Well, the researchers managed to get 20% more soybeans out of a single harvest. Not just that, crop genetics are also making the food we eat more resistant to diseases, which means less pesticides in your food. I don't know about you, but I'd rather have pesticide-free GMO corn than organic corn that's doused with chemicals. Look, this stuff can sound pretty boring, but we're talking about the food on your plate. What could be more important than that? Better crop genetics means a larger food supply, which leads to cheaper food prices, not to mention healthier people around the world. There's another benefit to this that no one talks about, namely that fewer people need to be farmers nowadays. Back in 1870, over half of all Americans were farmers. If you weren't a farmer, that meant you were super privileged in the olden days. However, thanks to crop genetics getting so advanced, not even 2% of Americans have to work on farms anymore because everything's so efficient that just a handful of farmers can feed a whole country. So, how can a regular farmer use crop genetics? Well, there are some simple methods out there that don't require any fancy gadgets or science. Remember, crop genetics is older than the wheel. And if ancient humans could do it, so can you. In case you're a farmer that wants to use these advanced methods to get more bang for your buck, you should start by picking the right seeds. Try to figure out what sort of soil and environment you're working with. I'm willing to bet that there are some seeds out there that are perfect for your conditions. Now, once you've got your crops growing, crop genetics can help you find which plants have the phenotypes you're looking for. This is where marker-assisted selection can come in handy. You just need to send a sample on over to a lab so they can conduct a molecular marker analysis, and they'll mark the genes that you might want to encourage in your future crops. Biogemma, Illumina, and Keygene are all great companies offering genetic analysis. So you just need to breed the plants they mark together to create your very own super crops. Understanding the genetic makeup of your crops can also help you use precision agriculture, which is basically what James Schnabel and his team were doing with their corn and sorghum fields. So, from the simple yet technologically advanced solutions that farmers can get, to the way machine learning is helping these innovations see the light of day, this was everything you needed to know about how crop genetics creates more food and profit for everyone.